like to restart the reconvene the PV summit. Uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, John. Hello. Hello. Can you, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'd like to call on stage uh, our next speaker, Dr. Anna Gangtel from Michigan State University. Hello, hello everyone. I'm just going to wait for my slide to show up. And thanks for everybody that stayed a little bit longer after lunch for uh, this uh, meeting. So my name is uh, Annie Gangtel. I'm a faculty at Michigan State. Uh, and my work is a little bit different with, than what you've seen this morning. So we saw a lot of um, new interests. Oh, I don't have a. Yeah, um, so we've seen a lot of good data, and it's pretty encouraging how much like solar is being installed and um, the prospect for uh, solar energy. But what I want to present today is some aspect re related to some emerging PV technology. So when I saw everybody that was presenting today, I saw some people expert in CATEL, some people in more 3.5, different technologies. So I'm trying to stay a little bit outside of that. And my expertise is really emerging uh, PV technologies. So uh, first, to go back, when we're thinking about like what is sustainable photovoltaics, we should consider all the stage, not necessarily just the uh, the ideal stage, so we all know that solar uh, can produce good electricity to replace uh, carbon um, emitting energy, so that looks pretty good. But to be really sustainable, we need to consider all the stage from the raw material extraction, the manufacturing, the use, and the non-ideal use, if there are any fires or other accidents, and finally, the end of life. And all of my research is towards all those different stages and looking at the where we can improve um, the manufacturing, use, and end of life for a variety of different photovoltaics. But um, as I said today, we'll talk mostly about emerging technology and how we can guide research to make them better on the long term. So let's start with the end of life. And what I want to show is that it's pretty good. We've been installing a lot more solar than we thought we would be, but we've also underestimated how much waste we're likely to make. So this is like a total amount, um, if we look in the 2010 prediction, how much uh, we would install PV. If you consider that it's going to reach end of life after 30 years, that didn't look like we would have any problem until 2030. Two years later, with the updated data about how much we install, that looks a lot worse. And if I continue doing that, which I haven't done yet, this is getting closer and closer to where we are now. In addition to just the um, end of life, we need to consider some early retirement from the solar panels due to different reliability or some just installation. Sometimes we just break solar panels when we install them. And even though that might seem pretty small, considering the volume that is being installed, that goes quickly um, in the amount of waste we're generating. So just to give you an idea, this amount in uh, 2040 is about the size of 40% of our current e-waste. So that's a really large volume compared to what we're producing in terms of um, electronic waste. So compared to if you have like one TV, if you're installing million panels of um, solar panels and you retire all of those, that's the equivalent of a lot of uh, TV screen. So what is that PV, sta uh, PV waste? If we consider what we're producing today, it's going to be mostly silicon, SIGs, CATEL, and some of those materials have pretty high value. So mostly in sil uh, silicon, we have silver, SIGs, uh, indium gallium, CATERIDE, mostly terrarium. And these three have a pretty good motivation to recycle those modules. So that looks um, pretty good. But if you look at all the mix and the hotter technology that's being uh, produced, that's not the only um, materials. So I like to look at the full periodic uh, table and look at all the materials that are currently being used in different technology. And if you have material like gold, which is um, expensive and not really toxic, then that's pretty straightforward. We're going to recycle it. What I'm worried about is more materials like um, cadmium, it's not so bad, but lead, molybdenum, zinc, or other elements that have really low value but are toxic. But if you um, have a small amount in a panel, it still can reach the landfill and be um, an issue in the future. So some of my work is on the toxicity and landfill, and my student Kayla over there is working on that, if you have any questions, but that's not really what I want to talk today. 
So as we um, make modules, if you look at the material flow from PV waste, this is just based on what was generated in Europe in 2012. Um, and we had CAD tail uh, silicon, a little bit of six. What you see in terms of weight is that we have mostly glass, and glass has really little value, but most of the waste stream comes from uh, terrarium or other elements um, that have much higher value but contribute a really small amount in terms of mass. But this is also the elements that we're trying to reduce in new technology because that's what makes the solar panels pretty expensive. So um, this is a study I showed a couple of years ago here, actually, that shows how uh, panels, depending on technology, are more and more complex or um, the value uh, in terms of recyclability. And what we see is that some of the panels, such as catelerium, which are pretty simple, have high value. They are not really complex, so they have a pretty good chance of being recycled compared to other module. Six is not as good, but mostly when we start replacing some of the elements, such as um, in the kestrites, then we're going towards lower uh, value and more likelihood to go into the landfill. So if you're trying to really design product for end of life and recyclability, you would want them to have more value, but, or at least being more simple because that helps for your recyclability. But in terms of installing PV, what is the trend is not to make them more expensive because then you cannot compete with other type of energy. So really what we're doing is that we're going towards design for lower cost and we're increasing the complexity. You can see it a little bit from the silicon going from monocrystalline to crystalline. Um, it's lower value a little bit, but um, new technology would probably go this way because we're trying to replace the expensive element to uh, reduce the cost. So my question is really in my research is um, how can we design solar cells for sustainability, not just for recycling or for um, lower cost, but considering all the different aspects from the manufacturing down to the end of life to minimize how toxic or how they perform. So my motivation is mostly that most LC has been used for commercialized technology, and I'm more interested in using it for developing new technologies. Um, and those new technologies can contain a lot of new materials that are of limited toxicity in life cycle and inventory. And most metallurgy have look at the application of solar panels for a really large scale, and there's new application for solar technology um, that have not been considered. So I use LCA uh, mostly to assist the development of new product and identify critical steps and evaluate the impacts of new technology. So what I work on right now, I'm back at doing organic solar cells um, because that's kind of interesting, but a few weeks ago there was this article about the future of low-cost solar cells. So if you um, are not familiar with organic solar cells, they always had the promise of being so cheap that everybody could um, afford them, but um, We've been working on them for over 10 years, and they are not really getting cheaper or not fast enough to compete with other technology. So um, first company, Conarca, kind of commercialized them probably way too fast, and they went bankrupt, I think it's 2012 actually, which was bad because I just graduated, so I was pretty sure I wouldn't work for a company like them. Then um, there are now, this is showing like uh, Iliatek, and I feel like every year they've been pushing back their commercialization year, so now it's 2018. I'm pretty sure I read 2016, two years ago. So it um, doesn't seem like um, organic solar cells are coming um, to production really quickly. So um, I'm using that for my research. The other reason is because I moved to Michigan State, and um, there's Dr. Lund over there, so that's his specialty to make uh, organic solar cells that are transparent. So um, I'm going to use this. Uh, material and this technology to evaluate if we can really design uh, technology from the start to make them cheaper and also help to uh, commercialize them. So it doesn't hurt to that I've actually, I'm not as famous as Dr. Lund, but I got the first PhD in sustainability from RIT with Ryan, and all my work was on organic solar cells. So when I did my PhD, I looked at the environmental impact of uh, fullerenes in organic solar cells and looking at how, even though you're using a really small amount of material, it has a really large environmental impact, much more than we thought. Then I used that to do the life cycle assessment of organic photovoltaics, look at how over 
and 26 different configurations and see how they compare. And finally, use that to guide new type of device based on the result I've done. So I had developed this approach where you uh, really make the device and then look how you can improve uh, from, the, from scratch. So as I said, what we found before was that um, material use for solar application has really large amount of energy. And basically, when you try to do electronic grade material, you need a lot of purification, a lot of solvent, and it's really energy intensive. Um, that's just the structure of a organic solar cell. So you have a blocking layer, then you mix a donor um, and acceptor, different blocking layers there. And that's pretty much all the different type of material you can make there. And that's all inventory I did before. And I didn't do any organic for five years. I work on other technology as a postdoc and after for my research. And I was surprised when I went back to look at OPV that nobody has tried to do any more material or new technology in the last five years. And there's still only just one paper on small molecules, which is the one I did. Um, and in that one, I showed that small molecules add a much lower embodied energy, lower environmental impacts. So in my opinion, they are better for future um, technology. So another aspect of doing LCA and using the life cycle inventory is it gives you a good indication of the cost of the technology you're developing. So even though organic so solar cells are expected to be super cheap, they are still made of coal product or petroleum uh, as a starting material. And this is just showing like different generation and how we want to be cheaper and the red shows where organics are supposed to be, they are supposed to be really, really cheap and maybe not super efficient. But um, when I did the LCA of it, uh, based on just current material, you would get like a price about $11. But if you go back to all the raw material that is really required for making those material, that would give me a price about $4.7 uh, per watt, which is way too much for uh, solar technology. And that's all the technology I did before. So, um, we really think that we can use this information to try to reduce from the design um, what is the impact of the technology. Another aspect is just that most uh, applications have just considered what is the impact of solar as a large scale technology. So usually the only thing that changed is uh, what type of modules you're installing and how much electricity is being generated depending on where you're installing it. But as I show, those solar technology, we can make them transparent, so that opens a lot of different applications which have not been considered in terms of LCA. So because I think the normal energy payback time or the um, cumulative energy demand is not really useful because this is all showing all um, organics are way lower than any other technology, but still they are not really commercialized. So this is not really useful LCA information for helping technology to reach market but it could be used in the developing uh, phase. So what we do is actually we design for sustainability. So what we do is we look at the current way they are making a device and then trying to not only lower the cost, but also uh, consider what is the health impact and the environmental impact at the same time. And uh, we started working with uh, chloroaluminum thiocyanine and C60. And this is just to give you an idea of like the price of the material. So if you look at fullerenes, even the raw soot is the more expensive than gold. So there's a lot of space for improvement, even in the material side, to reduce the, um, the impact of this material census. So the first material we've been working on is aluminum chloro, um, chloroaluminum thalocyanine uh, there. So what my student in Sang has been doing is looking at alternative way of making chloroaluminum thalocyanine using a uh, different precursor, both uh, phthalic anhydride and phthalonitrile. And we look at this one because it's 150 times uh, cheaper than the other one and using also microwave uh, synthesis. So the goal is really to find a way to reduce by design from the start, from the material down to the device and having device that perform the same way, but um, overall better for the environment. So we do all the synthesis, we do the life cycle inventory uh, and finally the uh, life cycle assessment and we compare also with material we can purchase. That's just to give you an idea of how complex the normal census is and how we can uh, simplify that by the microwave census. There's also another advantage is that the reaction is much faster. So we take 45 minutes instead of six hours. So that's really good for commercialization. But the idea is really that when we do that, we're really trying to reduce how much energy 
Um, in this case, it's just the environmental impact. We don't have all the full costs uh, and everything, but that gives us a pretty good idea where we should improve in the future. So right now, this process is still the best one compared to the reference one, uh, but we need to work on the solvent because that's what contributes the most to our um, impact. The other aspect is to consider the um, LCA of transparent photovoltaics. So compared to other technology now, um, those modules, if you tune them and you make them thin enough, you can use them um, in Windows, Skylight, and cell phones. Um, and then we need to consider what is the net environmental benefit. So it's not just to produce electricity. So if you put um, a transparent photovoltaic like that, you have negative impact from the fabrication, um, but then you produce uh, electricity. So that's the typical way we're calculating the net environmental impact for solar modules, but in that case, we're also reducing the electricity from cooling because this um, modules, this window, is capturing the infrared region, so it really helps for the cooling. But if you install those windows in the north, like I'm from Michigan, um, then you will need in the winter to have additional heating. So we're calculating what is the actual net benefit of those technology there. The other application is, for example, in mobile, uh, mobile device. So if you're covering this screen uh, with this, solar technology, you don't see it, but what it does is it's actually charging your battery, so you need to calculate the net benefit compared to if you were um, charging it from the grid, so you have some benefit there. And finally, we're looking at how this would impact the overall impact if you're installing it in different place, and if you're changing all your windows in a, in a building, you would only not only select like the one that are uh, perfectly oriented, but look at all the different orientation and the overall benefit of installing those type of windows um, at different places uh, in the U.S. So, in summary, um, there's a lot of different technology that are emerging, uh, and the trend is mostly design them for lower costs, which is not really in line with the goal of designing for sustainability, because a lot of the solutions that are emerging kind of increase the complexity and also the likelihood of ending up in the landfill. And the organic photovoltaics is a good example for that. So my work is really looking at trying to reduce the impact of making them because there's really li little chance that they are going to even be recycled, so should, they should have the lowest impact possible. So we're trying to reduce the cost, environmental impact, and health impact at the same time from the raw material fabrication down to the final product and also evaluate new application for solar technology to reduce uh, the impact. I want to thank my student, Hin Sang, who presented most of those results on Monday, the poster, and Kayla also works on that solar project. And I'm at Michigan State now, but used to be at Clemson University. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we're doing this modeling, so we have the data, and uh, so we're actually modeling it in window models and stuff, so they are, yeah, it's being done. Because there's a, a trade-off, too, but there are different integration. I just show as if we are just coding the window, but there's also the possibility that you're making films, and then you don't necessarily need to keep those, like, plastic films on your window, like, just uh, stuff that would be removable, so. What? Yeah, I like shades. So, like, it, you would put them down during the summer, uh, like in Michigan, but um, then you don't necessarily need them in the winter because it's just automatic. You kind of feel that you need to eat or not. <laughs> so, but, so there's different design product. I just simplify it there. Yeah, uh, Eric. Uh, oh. Yeah, I've, I've seen all the stuff that's been done. I've not been, uh, there was, there are some good, this morning the lady who presented, that was, um, that was pretty good, but, so one thing I didn't, I kind of say I did a lot of data work on doing the life cycle inventory, so one big problem in doing a life cycle assessment of new technology is that there are actually no life cycle inventory, so if people don't realize that, they just conclude that there's no impact, but mostly it's because there's no data. So it takes a lot of time to construct all those life cycle inventory, and a lot of the early perovskite analysis were based on no data, so uh, you need to be careful about that. But I'm more interested in looking how the perovskite 
fit in there and like all technology have evolved in terms of like complexity and value than I am in actually doing the but actually Dr. Lin group is doing also perovskite so I might do that when I'm but I'm more interested in door transparent because there's a it's a more interesting change in application compared to traditional solar panels. Yeah. You mean like in carbon footprint or? So they, they, so the thing for all solar and some people have presented some data on the energy payback time and all those different things. So they are pretty small usually because we divide their impact over the 30 years um, time. But what I'm interested in there is that a lot of those applications, for example, won't consider if you're putting them on a cell phone, then you're not going to use that for 30 years. So now maybe, um, but I'm not done doing that work, but then it, it could change with that. But normally, uh, all the impacts are really small, which doesn't really help developing new technology because we all think the energy payback time is really low. It takes like less than 1.5 years. The carbon footprint is really low too, so that doesn't help so much um, in the developing phase. Yeah. I'm not sure all is incorporating stakeholder. Um, so I would say at this point I'm not doing it really. Um, we have a really different approach. So he's working more on like already commercialized and see what people care the most, for example. Um, I'm more looking into using LCA for developing new technologies. Um, but no, I don't really. Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, it's implicit. I don't use it explicitly. Um, and also, I have different stakeholders in the sense that some people, uh, yeah, I consider the recyclers and also people that want to install, but they want to install, you want to install solar that have minimal impact and people care about toxicity and all those different aspects, but I don't explicitly consider stakeholders. Okay, any last question? Oh, yeah, one. <laughs> So I don't consider land use because if you're using them in buildings, in the specific application I'm using, um, there's not land use. Like, okay, so that's the thing. Organic solar cells will never be used in power system. Like, and that's not even useful to compare them uh, with the other one. That's just a different application, and that's why, it, for me, it's interesting to use this approach because they are solar technology, but they are going to be used in a really different way. And in the way they are probably being used, if they are used in uh, windows like that or in cell phones, they are even more likely to end up in the landfill because if they are included in product, it's even harder to recycle them or recy like remove the material. So um, if it's in, on a cell phone, it will follow the same waste stream. So good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uncle. I'd like to call on the next speaker, uh, Dr. Cooper from SUNY. I'll give you a buzz when you have five minutes. Okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to speak about what we're doing at SUNY Polytechnic Institute in the context of uh, silicon PV manufacturing and what we're trying to do to advance technology. Brief overview of my talk. 
I'll go over the state of the PV industry. We've heard a lot today about that. Hopefully, I'll touch on some topics we haven't heard of. Uh, overview of PV manufacturing for silicon. And I'll go specifically into metallization. That's uh, the focus, one of the focuses of my lab, and uh, specifically how can we, we can uh, figure out ways of replacing silver. And in the end, I'll talk a bit about the lab we've set up in Rochester, New York, just down the street from Ryan. So what's the, tech, what's the uh, motivation here? We all have seen these nice little curves with the big giant PV sun, looking at the, comparing the different technologies for energy. Here's another way of looking at it. In one hour, there's enough sunlight to satisfy the, the Earth's energy needs. So it's our responsibility then to figure out how can we harness it sustainably and uh, with uh, low cost, et cetera. Another way of thinking of this is if you could stick about 18,000 square, 18, square miles of panels somewhere around here, you could power the U.S. With, that, with the power generated from those panels. Obviously, that's not reasonable. The transmission losses would be very high, but if we could spread that out across the country, putting it where it makes sense, obviously the, the sun is not the problem. It's the technology and the policy supporting the technology. So it's interesting to, to think about the historical development of our field, the PV field. Uh, you can trace it back to Becquerel in the 18, 1800s when he found the photoelectric effect. And coming up through uh, the 20th century, we can thank on semiconductor t technology like the transistor that would eventually lead to people looking at uh, solar cells, putting them, putting them on satellites. And so up through the 80s and 90s, I'm looking here at the players out in the field who were dominant in PV manufacturing. In the 80s, 90s, it was basically US, Japan, and Europe. But then there was an explosion of growth through the 2000s, and we see the, uh, the, the entry of China and Taiwan. And we have them to thank for this huge market that we are uh, enjoying today. Hopefully, uh, the demand is spread across the world, but of course, uh, China and Taiwan account for the vast majority of PV that is made today. And uh, my estimate for the 2015 production was around 50 gigawatts, and that's expected to increase another 10, 15, 20 percent for 2016. Here's uh, another uh, picture from Ryan's presentation looking at uh, the expected growth of the industry over the next few years. I like highlighting also this, uh, this trend at the top, showing in the, in the late 2000s there was a very wide variety of year-on-year -year growths, over 100 percent one year, down to 6 percent another year. Very variable and uh, adolescent in my opinion. Hopefully as we go forward we'll reach sustainable growth patterns, as indicated here with this prediction of maybe uh, 6 or 20 percent year-on-year uh, -year growth. But ex expected by 2020 we'll reach the 700 gigawatt mark and anyone can extrapolate when we'll reach a terawatt, most likely sometime in the mid-2020s. So crystalline silicon is the workhorse of the industry. I think that's been, been stated here a couple times. And uh, this is just a breakdown of module production for 2010 and 2013 uh, globally. In 2010, module production was around 24 gigawatts. Uh, a vast majority of that was either multi or monocrystalline. And not much has changed since then. Uh, I don't have an updated figure for the current year. I couldn't find one. but in 2013, production went to 40 gigawatts, and crystalline silicon, again, is, is claiming more and more share of the mix. We've talked about this learning curve. For silicon and for CADTEL, I'm giving it to you here. Uh, again, what we're looking at is the cost of a panel, or cost uh, per watt for PV, as a function of cumulative shipments. So in 1975, when the industry only shipped maybe around one or two megawatts of panels, it costs $100 a watt. And as we've marched forward, we see this 20% reduction per decade on the log scale for cumulative module production. So a couple of blips in the curve around 2008, mid-2000s, there was a shortage of polysilicon, which led to uh, leveling off of module prices, and then a vast overproduction in the late 2000s or early 2010s, and until uh, we've reached this point now where, in 2014, at 177 gigawatts of production, uh, cumulative production, we were at 62 cents a watt, and last year, around 225 gigawatts were, were uh, total shipments and at 58 cents a watt. So we've marched down this curve fairly um, precisely. And it's fun to compare it to the, the CADTEL curve, which is, of course, almost completely due to first solar. We see that their costs have, uh, have come down. And um, it's almost parallel, I would say, with Crystal in these days. So hopefully, we can continue to compete and drive costs down farther. It's interesting to note that if you're a new technology, like a perovskite or an organic, you have to enter where the blue box is to compete, right? If you're at the hundreds of, or hundreds of megawatt scale production, you need to offer that product at 50 cents a watt, 40 cents, 30 cents a watt. 
So in addition to uh, module shipments, we can think about system prices. They've come down certainly over the years. 2013, uh, right around the time that this paper was published, uh, systems were around 3 to $5 a watt. That's for residential, utility, commercial. And we see a trend of continuing price reductions. Much of that has been due to the, the module and polysilicon price reductions, for instance. But uh, other things need to come down to, like balance of system, labor, permitting. And um, it's been hinted that perhaps we've, we, we know how to do that. And I, I expect that those who are experts in this, in this field will continue to flesh out that cost. Everyone talks about uh, this magic number of a dollar per watt systems as a, a grid parity point, where we're producing electricity at the same uh, lifetime averaged value that a coal-fired power plant or a natural gas power plant could give you power. And uh, perhaps this, is, this can be achieved, but can it be achieved sustainably? And when I say sustainably, I mean not only from an environmental standpoint, but from a business standpoint. Will, will there be a margin for module makers? It's hard to say. So now if we t speak more specifically about crystalline silicon, uh, PV modules are broken up into three parts mainly, the wafer, the cell, and the module in terms of cost. Cell conversion can be up to one-third of that cost, and one-third of cell conversion can be metallization. As you can see here in this, this pie chart I made, this is, um, I broke this up into the different manufacturing steps, and you can see for this particular process, which was a few years old now, metallization was 30%. This is primarily due to silver. So now let's talk more specifically about crystalline silicon PV manufacturing. Here's an overview of the process. It's uh, broken down into about, about five steps. Wafer inspection, cleaning, PN junction formation, passivation, ARC, and metallization. So inspection is where you're looking at each wafer, trying to decide which one's the best, looking for a particular spec that was delivered from a vendor, pass that through that machine. And in the cleaning process, you're not only uh, removing contaminants that could, be, uh, could cause damage to the cell later on, but you're also imparting a texture. For mono, you're creating very small pyramids, pyramids on the surface. And for multi, usually it's an acid or an RAE that causes a, a roughening of the surface for anti-reflection purposes. Next, you would provide a, a junction at the interface. P-type is the most dominant crystalline silicon technology. So on top of this P-type bulk, you uh, add an N-type skin, usually by uh, maybe a Pockel uh, diffusion process, as shown here at the top, inside some kind of uh, uh, quartz tube, many of them, forming a uh, a junction at this interface with a very high n-type concentration. And then also you need to remove the glass, which is shown here in step 3A, another wet process step, usually involving HF. After this, you would provide at least a one layer of anti-reflection. Uh, PECVD is one of the most common methods using silicon nitride, very thin layer, only 80 nanometers, not only to provide passivation to that surface, but also to add an anti-reflection component, increasing current. And so finally, uh, we'll get to what is more the point of this talk, which is metallization. And the current technologies I'll talk about in, in more detail, and the impact of silver use in terms of industrial approaches as well as the environment, and talk ab about some alternative metallization strategies. So the current dominant technology for crystalline silicon is screen printing. Very simple approach, just like making a t-shirt. You take uh, metal pastes, which are made of uh, a metal powder, organics, binders, and some glass frit, and you pass it across a, a screen with, a, with an imparted um, pattern onto the, onto the wafer, and it's held in place until it's annealed. Front side is silver, back side is mainly aluminum. And the aluminum process, uh, not only does it act as a contact, but it also forms what's known as a back surface field. Aluminum is a P-type uh, material. It will impart a P-type character to silicon. And uh, following this annealing curve for a typical process where you have a ramping up to about maybe five or 600 degrees Celsius, then a spike to 800, and a cool off during this contact anneal, what we see is uh, following these same numbers, aluminum will begin to melt and mix with silicon, forming a particular percentage point, and then be rejected back out past the eutectic, forming a very highly P-type interface, only, only a few microns into that back, back side. This is in order to uh, reflect minority carrier electrons from uh, rec recombining at the rear surface. For the front side, we have silver. And uh, again, we're following the similar uh, trend. Since it's a co-firing process, you're annealing both the front and back at the same time. If we follow the curve, we see uh, at first we're volatilizing solvents, burning out the binders, which kept the, the form of the, of the grid lines in place. 
And then when we reach this uh, center point, number three, uh, this is a curve I took from Gunnar Schubert's thesis from 2006, where he's suggesting that uh, the, the frit present in the, the, in the paste will etch through the silicon nitride, silver, uh, lead, and silicon will begin to melt, there may be a redox reaction involved, and we form these uh, crystallites at the surface that are thought to be conduction paths to the line. So silver has been the dominant material used for front side contact. It's very popular, very successful, but how can we reach terawatt scale with silver? Let's talk about it. So this is a curve, or this figure that talks about uh, total supply of silver and the demand of silver for the last few years. You can see that uh, the world's produced somewhere around uh, a million, million ounces or so uh, over the past, uh, per year. And we can break down the, also the consumption for uh, either electronics or photography. And you can see here's PV. It's marching up. It's very, very small, perhaps in 2005, very little. But you can see it's um, gone up almost 10x over 10 years. And uh, in fact, the PV demand for 2015, which was not in this chart, was around 77 million ounces. This is only 13% of industrial demand, which was around 580 million ounces, but 7% of total. So you think, oh, this is no big deal. But if we want to reach terawatt scale deployment, PV demand is going to top the list eventually, and maybe even go beyond. So uh, let's continue to talk about the impact of silver. This chart is looking at the price of silver since 1980. And uh, at some points, it's been $5 an ounce. At some points, it's been $50 an ounce. And I think the precious metal character of silver means that it's always going to be a popular investment vehicle. And other reasons are going to cause its price to go up and down. You can see as recent as 2010, we almost reached the $50 an ounce point. OK, it's come down to maybe $15 or $16 an ounce now. But when is it going to go back up? I think anybody can guess. And uh, this has a strong impact, I think, on the industry, especially as we continue to ramp into this hundreds of gigawatts, terawatts scale. Uh, the PV industry is not going to be immune to this uh, market speculation. Another aspect of its impact is talking about uh, where it goes when we're mining silver, looking for it in the environment. Uh, you know, there's a particular part of it that's going to go into the land or the water or the air. And uh, though 60% of it is recycled, there's much loss to emissions. And uh, we've heard about some PV recycling efforts. I, I know that that's going to have to be a reality. Every, every um, plant owner is going to have to have a, a recycling scheme. It's only the right thing to do. But is recycling silver enough? Is mining it and recycling it enough to reach terawatt scale for crystal and silicon PV? I don't think so. I think a lot of you probably don't think so. And what's an alternative? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest now that copper is a good alternative to silver. And here I'm comparing a couple of different properties. First, we'll start with a, with, a, with a physical property, bulk resistivity. I'm talking about how conductive a line is if you've placed it down and you've, and you've centered it or you've plated it. And uh, for, for bulk silver, right around 1 times 10 to the negative 6 ohm centimeter. Copper is not so far behind, so it's almost as conductive as silver. Market price as of the end of April for silver was almost $18 an ounce, 100 times less expensive for copper. And of course, we can continue to march down these, uh, these figures and see that the production is nearly uh, 1,000 times or so higher for copper. And the proven reserves are much, much higher for copper. So what does all this mean for PV? Taking a few assumptions, which I, I state down here, about how thick is our conductor line, what is our metal coverage, and the, and the module efficiency, the potential deployment based on known, known silver reserves and perhaps even incorporating a recycling program is up to only 5 terawatts. But if we extrapolate out for copper, 3,000 terawatt hour, terawatts peak. That's even beyond my capacity to understand how the PV industry can even reach that level. Uh, but you know, some papers suggest that electricity consumption in the 2050 time frame may be 10, or I'm sorry, 40, 50 terawatt hours. So certainly, copper can support uh, that level of deployment, even if PV were 100% of our uh, energy mix, which I hope it never is, because just like oil is held by those in power, PV will then be held by those in power, right? So for silicon to reach terawatt levels of penetration, we have to replace silver. But copper is not just a one for one. Uh, copper is, a, 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 though, though it has good bulk resistivity and it's much cheaper, there are problems with copper that have to be mitigated. For instance, uh, copper is considered a deep level trap in silicon, meaning that if it diffuses into the bulk, it will poison the cell, causing the, the, the performance to drop. Here we're looking at uh, one of these performance factors. Without uh, some barrier layer in place, the performance of the cell drops out very quickly under thermal stress compared to a control here on top. 
Uh, one of these barrier layers is, is a silicide, either nickel or titanium silicide. And then here's an interface structure of one of these where we have a silicon layer with a very thin nickel layer uh, on top of that, overcoated with copper. Research has shown that uh, this is a, a good stack system in order to prevent this migration of copper into the bulk. Few different companies across the world have commercialized uh, systems for incorporating copper. Most popular so far has been plating. Reina, I'm showing you a picture here of one of their products where they've, uh, they're light induced plating copper onto the front side of a device while contacting on the rear, floating it inside some bath. Uh, we can't anneal copper the same way we anneal a silver paste. It will oxidize very readily in the air and uh, it will cause problems for reliability later on. So plating seems to be the best option. Light induced plating using the potential, natural potential of the solar cell is one way to do it. As I mentioned, Reina is offering that. Another way is electrochemical plating. Uh, Bessie Miko is a Dutch company that offers a, a product that could be for that. And here I'm just showing you a picture of a plated line on top of a solar cell. So, of course, uh, International Technology Roadmap for PV suggests plating will continue to be adopted over the years and we'll see a, this steady reduction of silver and a steady increase in plating technologies most likely dominated by copper. So now I'd just like to introduce to you the, the, the facility that we've set up in Rochester, New York, again just down the street from RIT, where we have um, basically a P-type pilot line that we're offering to the, to the U.S. and global PV industry for development resource as well as collaboration on technology development. And uh, we're, we're supported by the Department of Energy Sunshot Initiative and also the New York State Energy uh, Research and Development Authority. A bit about SUNY Poly, we're located all the way across the state. Our headquarters are in Albany where we have a large semiconductor effort, but uh, SUNY Poly has their fingers in a little bit of everything, PV, IC, power electronics, photonics, MEMS, and uh, it's interesting to watch them spread across the state. Just an overview of our fab area. We have all the tools you need for a P-type solar cell, uh, including uh, some advanced metallization. We're planning to buy a tool for copper electrochemical plating soon in order to service one of our projects. Um, all metrology, of course, uh, IQE, light IV, lipsometry, uh, resistance measurements, things like that. A couple of our specific tools, we have uh, two high throughput bacinis for screen printing, a desk batch firing furnace, um, another, another Inalos laser, laser system. This is the system we're planning to buy from Miko where we're going to be developing copper processes for one of our, one of our tenants. So PV industry has been growing, gangbusters, that was the word that was used earlier, right? Very large uh, compound annual growth rate. It's expected to reach a terawatt by the mid-2020s and continue to grow ho hopefully beyond that. But in order to go continue on that track, if crystalline silicon is going to remain dominant, we have to replace silver. I think that's just critical. Everybody understands that. Copper is a good technology to do that, and hopefully uh, the work we're doing at SUNY Poly will be, uh, be enable the industry, especially in the U.S., to consider copper, perhaps adopt it as a, as a technology replacement. And I appreciate your attention. Yes, sir. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, the Hunt, Brunter, Hunt Brothers cornering scandal, I read a bit about it. I think it was just uh, probably a blip. I don't know if anybody would try that again. Maybe they will. <laughs> but I think the second rise is more real. It's, it's when, you know, we were going through uh, the global downturn and people were looking to ways of, of investing their money in something that was a bit more secure than, let's say, uh, uh, hedge funds or whatever. And silver is a precious metal. We can't get around that. And so we saw that spike in, in prices. Now it's come down more recently, perhaps for, for various reasons, but uh, I think it's clear that it's not going to stay low. It's not going to go down to $5 an ounce. It, it just, uh, I think that precious metal status will prevent that. Um, to come back to your other question, uh, silver has, uh, I think I, I showed a bar chart, I'm sorry, a pie chart that showed it was perhaps 30% of the sell cost which, you know, it's only a third of the cell, and the cell is a third of the module. So, you know, total overall cost is maybe less than 10% of the module, but it's a significant part, right? And um, if we're looking for low-hanging fruit to continue to decrease cost in PV, get down to the point where we can reach sustainable dollar-a-watt values, silver seems like a good candidate. 
It's just a matter of figuring out how to uh, supplant the infrastructure that's in place for manufacturing, which is screen printing. Screen printing is dominant. It's everywhere. It's very easy to do. It's relatively cheap, except for the solar. If we could screen print copper reliably and anneal it reliably, I think that would be uh, preferable, but it's not clear that that's true. Sure. I think it'll be interesting if 10, 15 years from now we see spiking of copper prices because of consumption levels reaching, reaching that point. That's probably what will happen. Sure. But either way, silver's, I mean, we, silver can't even approach it. So yeah, we'll have another problem to deal with 10, 15, 20 years down the line, but at least we can overcome one for now, right? Aluminum, of course, of course. But uh, a relatively immature, I think, technology compared comparatively. Sure. But I wonder, will it be 100x more expensive? You know, if, if it's a, anybody's guess, I guess, and the mining people will know better than me, but that's, that's I mean, is that our standard? If it reaches $15 an ounce, then yeah, we've, you know, we screwed the pooch, but hopefully it won't reach that level. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I guess I would say I focused more on the PV applications of it rather than the semi-applications, semi but I would hope we've learned from them. I mean, you know, Semitech did a good job of uh, roping us out of the 80s, so there's a lot of learning we can do, I think. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a forecast, right? So it's not, it hasn't been done. I assume it probably has to do with replacement because ultimately, in order to maintain cell performance, there's a minimum conductor volume you have to maintain, right? Now let's say if you could put down a pure piece of silver onto your wafer, yeah, it could be fairly small. But if you, if you continue to reduce the volume, you're going to reach a point where resistance begins to dominate your cell performance. So I think it's more of a replacement in addition to a reduction. Copper, uh, copper is a good example. I think uh, that's probably what will end up being the, the, the dominant low-hanging fruit replacements. Other metals, maybe. Uh, aluminum has been suggested. Possibly. I think it's, 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 there, there's still a lot to be wrung out of the silver consumption level. I think, you know, if you look at a screen-printed line, it's very non-homogenous. It's not a pure piece of silver has glass frit all spread out through it, so if we can continue to densify the line, we can reduce its volume, not necessarily the silver content, because there will be a minimum amount of conductor material required. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I'd like to Welcome our final speaker, Dr. Meng Tao from ASU. Yeah, uh, you know we uh, saved the best for last, so I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to continue the uh, discussion uh, Ricky studied this morning to talk about recycling of uh, silicon solar module. Which one is? Ah, oh, oh, okay. Good, thank you. So I will talk about the need to recycle silicon modules, uh, the incentive to recycle silicon modules, and uh, the technology to recycle, as well as our recent progress. So uh, this has been pretty much covered, and uh, 
Uh, the projection is that by 2100, we will need, uh, I'm still learning this thing. Uh, we need uh, 46 terawatts of energy. That means the PV has to be deployed at a scale of tens of peak terawatts. Let's do some math. If we say 30% of energy come from PV by 2100, we need about 13.8 terawatts time average output. That means 92 peak terawatts. So today's modules have an average lifetime of 25 years. That means each year we will have about 3.7 peak terawatts dead modules, and they cover an area of 2.2 I'm 10 to the power 4 square kilometers. That's the size of New Jersey. So uh, we have to recycle uh, dead modules or they will lead our planet very quickly. Now there are four PV technologies today, uh, commercial technologies today. And uh, first, uh, first of all, has wow, I'm still learning this. <laughs> uh, Telluride has 4% of the market, and uh, first solar is doing a good job in recycling their modules. But the silicon has over 90% of the market, but the silicon is not recycled today. So it's, 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 I think it's common sense to recycle silicon modules. Now, this is a slide uh, Ian covered really well, and uh, uh, there's a scarcity of, I think. Uh, there's a scarcity of silver, and uh, if you look at the reserve, look at the annual production, that means silver will be depleted uh, in 20 years. And uh, so, uh, the previous talk talked about uh, replacing silver, and I'm going to focus on uh, recycling silver. And there's also quite a bit of energy saving in recycled silicon modules because uh, this is the current industrial process to go from quartz to metallurgical gray sil silicon, tricolorosilin, polysilicon, ingot, wafer cells modules. It's a very intensive energy process, especially this Siemens process, which is probably the most energy intensive step in the process. And uh, you can look at the energy intensity of the wafers. For modern wafers, it's over 1,000 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Multi is 725 kilowatt hours, kilowatt hours per kilogram. But uh, if we can use recycled silicon in this ingot growth stage, we cut down those numbers to 330 kilowatt hours per kilogram for mono and uh, 80 kilowatt hours per kilogram for multi. So that's a significant energy savings. Now, when we talk about recycling, the question is uh, who's going to pay for it? And uh, uh, Anika had this, uh, this uh, uh, argument, which I totally agree. That is, if you look at uh, all the, like, uh, the uh, copper wires, the sword, uh, the uh, glass, EVA, back sheet, uh, aluminum flame junction box, they have very little values as raw materials. So they will not cover your cost of recycling. But uh, fortunately, for silicon solar cells, they are valuable materials. There are two valuable materials. One is the solar gray silicon, and uh, which in I just checked yesterday, it's uh, almost $14 per kilogram. And uh, silver is about $17 per ounce right now. So if you can recover 85% of silicon as solar gray silicon, we can generate about $7.50. If you can recover 95% of the silver, we can get $3.50. So we can generate roughly $11 per module by getting all the valuable materials out of the uh, 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 module. So this is far better than the fee PV cycle imposes on uh, uh, module manufacturers. PV cycle charges like one euro per module in Europe to do recycling, but we can generate almost uh, 10 times the uh, amount. So I think that uh, silicon module recycling can be a profitable business without any subsidy. And uh, also I spoke with the PV cycle, actually about 70 to 80 percent of their cost is uh, to collect the small quantities of dead modules across Europe. Uh, because that's a large uh, 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 area and uh, the quantity is very small. So uh, this gets into my next slide. That is, uh, what is a good way to recycle, uh, 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 to, to collect uh, uh, dead modules? And the uh, proposal I have is that we should run the uh, uh, current distribution network for PV modules in the reverse order. We have manufacturers sending modules to distributors um, and then to retailers uh, and then to homeowners. Then we have installers in the middle. For recycling, we should run this in the opposite order. That is, uh, installers go to uh, homes to get uh, dead modules and send those modules to retailers uh, and further to distributors, uh, further to re recyclers. And uh, since recyclers have a net revenue, so they can pay the distributors, they can pay the retailers, and they can pay the installers to get the dead modules back. Uh, 
This is what the PV cycle is doing for recycling, and they have three steps. One is the removal of the aluminum flame and junction box, and the shredding, and then the processing in a flat glass recycling line. Now, I have to remind you that after you get of the removed the aluminum flame junction box, this is what's left. All the valuable materials are still attached to the glass. So if you shred the glass, you actually shred everything together. So now also, uh, Luigi talked about that they can recover 90% of the metals, but if you look at first uh, PV cycle, they claim 90% recovery by weight, but a silicon module, 75% is the glass, another 15% is the aluminum. So if you talk about recovery by weight, it says nothing about uh, the valuable materials. I just don't think that's good figure valued in this case. Uh, let me skip this one. Now, in terms of recycle, in the old days, people think of uh, reclaim the cells or reclaim the wafers. But uh, since 2005, the thickness of the wafer has been below 200 microns. At that thickness, you have no chance of getting the cells or wafers out because they will all break when you se try to separate them from the glass. So the, I, the most recent idea is that we just get the silicon out. So now if you, we look at the cell structure and the, let's say we don't have the metal on top and the bottom, we only have the, the silicon piece in the middle. The front emitter, the back surface field are heavily doped. They are out of the specs of solar gray silicon. So the only part which is worth recovering is the P-type base. Then also from the uh, front side we have the silver and also from the solder we have uh, tin and the lead and uh, probably we have a uh, uh, copper wire as well. So we have uh, a total of five metals to recover. Now here is our uh, strategy to recycle. We need a two-step recycling. We need a module recycling. We need a cell recycling. Let me show you the next slide. This is what we uh, think is a reasonable way of doing it. We have dead modules coming in and then we remove the junction box, we remove the aluminum flame, we peel off the back sheet and then these are recycled. Then we simply burn off the EVA. The EVA can be a heat source when you burn off EVA. And at this stage, we have a string of interconnected cells broken or intact. Then we dissolve the metals and uh, recover the metals from the rich solution and the edge of the silicon nitride and the edge of the emitter back surface field, we get the solar gray silicon out. Then also we have waste chemicals to deal with. Now that most of the technology for, for, the, uh, for these steps are already uh, uh, there or have been discussed or researched. So the two technology which are not quite there yet. One is how to recover the metals and how to uh, get rid of emitter and the back surface field. So uh, here is what the, uh, 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 our approach. We have a total of five metals, copper, lead, tin, silver, and aluminum. And if we use nitric acid, we can dissolve four of the five metals, copper, lead, tin, and silver. So this is the cell structure before uh, nitric acid. After nitric acid, the front metal is completely dissolved. But the back metal aluminum still stays. And now we have a solution with four metals. The question is how you separate the metals one by one. So we use a technique called sequential electroweaning. Because if you look at the reduction potentials of the metals, they are actually quite different, except the lead and tin. They are quite similar, but uh, silver, copper, and uh, lead, they have quite different uh, reduction potentials. So if we use a three electro electrolytic cell, you can recover them one by one. So here is a rich solution with four metals in it. The, uh, it. It looks blue because it has copper in it. And also you can probably see the white powder at the bottom of it. That's tin, precipitates as tin dioxide. So we need to use either filtration or sedimentation to uh, uh, recover the uh, uh, tin. And then uh, the, and the rest of the solution has three metals, uh, silver, copper, and uh, lead. So here is a voltage of the solution. You can clearly see two reduction peaks, uh, silver reduction peak is at about 0.35 volts, and the copper is at 0.1 volts. So you can apply different voltages to get these metals uh, out one by one. So here is the experiment, the student data, when he did a really nice experiment. He looked at that, use the different reduction potentials from 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35. And then he simply looked at the deposits on the working electrode. And if the voltage you apply is below about 0.25 volts, from 0.25 to 0.35 volts, you see silver peak and you don't see copper. And the titanium peak is from the, 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 the working electrode. 
Then if you go below 0.2 volts, you clearly see copper, but you don't see silver. So we can easily get the uh, metal, uh, silver out first, and then second, uh, we can get uh, 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 copper out. And uh, because this paper will be presented, uh, uh, so sensitive. Yeah, this paper will be presented next month in Portland, so I'm going to talk, I'm not going to talk uh, uh, all the details about the work and uh, until next month. So the next question is uh, uh, recovery of solar gray silicon. And uh, now the first question is what agent should we use to remove the emitter, remove the back uh, uh, surface field? Uh, we choose the sodium hydroxide because in the previous step we have nitric acid, so if you mix the two solutions together, the two wastes can neutralize each other, so we have a minimal environmental impact. Also, the back surface field is typically like 20 micron thick, so we need an actuator of our half micron. And so here shows that if we raise the uh, temperature of the sodium hydroxide to 50 degrees C, we can uh, remove the 20 micron layer in about 30, 35 minutes, which is reasonable. Now, the next question is that uh, how to maximize the amount of solar gray silicon we recover? And because that's our revenue. And uh, the student actually came up with a very simple idea. And uh, he simply monitored the sheet resistance from the front side, from the back side using four point prober. So this is the cell after removing of silicon nitride, after the removing of the metals. We have the emitter, we have the base, we have the back surface field. So we measure the sheet resistance from the front side, from the back side. The red curve is the sheet resistance from the front side. The black curve is from the back side. Now here is the reciprocal sheet resistance versus time. Initially they are different because of you have a PN junction, so the front side is just the sheet resistance of emitter. But after 15 minutes, suddenly the two sheet resistances become identical. That's the time we know that the emitter is gone, so you no longer have a PN junction. And then at the 30 minutes, suddenly there's a change in the slope. That means the heavily doped back surface field is gone. We only have the base left. So as soon as you see this point, stop, you have the maximum amount of silicon you can get all of this. Now, we also look at uh, how much silicon is remaining uh, after 30 minutes. So this shows that the remaining weight of the wafer as a function of edge time after 30 minutes, we still have 91% of silicon remaining. That means we can recover 90% of silicon from a, a dead cell. And so if you look at the numbers, and, uh, and the a wafer is about 10.77 grams, and uh, uh, 90% is 9.8 grams, so at the current price, it's about 13 or 14 cents per sale. We can get all of it. Then we can also get about 4.5 cents out of silver. So right now, we can recover about 18 cents per sale. And if we can get 95% silver recovery, we can get about 19 cents per sale. OK, so here's the last slide. And uh, yeah, this is really for recycling, is really for a sustainable silicon PV industry. and. Uh, uh, we have to devalue add the recycling so we don't have to ask for, for policy, new legislation, or, or somebody is paying us for doing it. And uh, we can get about $11 worth of raw materials or 19 cents uh, worth of raw materials per sale. I also think lead is toxic, so we don't want the lead in the uh, recycling sludge. And uh, our technology can recover all the valuable toxic materials, and uh, we we'll use sequential reaction winning for metal recovery. Right now, we're recovering 75% of silver, but uh, eventually it should reach 90 or 95%. We can also recover lead, tin, and copper, and uh, we use sheet resistance monitoring to maximize the amount of silicon recovered. Uh, that's all. So thank you. Oh, that's too thin, because we add like 20 microns of each side. That means the wafer will be about 150 microns thick. So I think that's probably way too thin. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, if we don't break it in, in the process. Yeah, but uh, I think more likely it will just go back into uh, Chikorovsky uh, direction solidification. Uh, that's something we're doing. And, uh, scientists offer the to, to do a, a chemical analysis, and trainers also offer the to do chemical analysis, trace chemical analysis on these. But that's a good question, actually. I would. Well, they, they had, had to make a certification, correct? 
Yeah. And now, uh, the base actually meets the specs of solo gray silicon, 10 to 16 boron dopant. It's more of whether you introduce the contamination during the process. For example, that's actually one, one thing I was thinking. If you have copper in the system and the copper contaminates the surface of the, of the recovered silicon, then uh, probably the, the silicon you recover is useless. So it's, it's more of a contamination issue. So whether how contaminated the recovered silicon is and uh, how well we can clean it. So those two questions are still to be answered. Yeah. But if we don't have silicon, we lose like seven, eight dollars worth of uh, revenue per module. So yeah, this is. My general question is more of a measure of the state of the world right now. So if you're completely separate from the this for our unit, it's not going to have any significant effect. Because there were several years ago where the solar world had uh, an experimental aspect that was trying to do something called structural inversion. Are you talking about PV recycling, IRC? Yeah, there was a company, but uh, that one. Uh, no, that's a different one, okay. That was here. Uh, that was here, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that eventually became a PV cycle. Actually, the founder of that the company became the founder of PV cycle. Yeah. Uh, on the silicon side, we have seen a couple of papers and uh, with similar ideas, but not as clear as how you stop the edge process. That's the only thing which is new. But uh, on the metal side, uh, I have seen two papers mentioning that you can dissolve silver in, in nitric acid and uh, uh, recovering it by electric winning, but there's no experimental results. That, but here we also have uh, four metals instead of one metal. So that gets a much more complicated situation. So sequential energy winning, I don't see anybody doing it. Mm. There's a guy named Yeah, Kurt Wamba, yeah. yeah. Actually, I spoke with him. Yeah, yeah. yeah I spoke with him. Yeah. And the silver, I think we can probably sell easily on the market, but the solar gray silicon, that's a big question whether they are really good quality, in a good enough quality. It's the same question Ricky had and, and, and uh, 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 person in the audience had that question, whether that's good enough quality to be solar gray silicon. That's still a big question mark there, yeah. But if we don't get the silicon out, then we lose like 70% of the revenue, so then somebody has to pay for it. <laughs> Okay, good. So I guess uh, thank you. Um, so for the last part, I'd like to call back the speakers in the same order they spoke, just to summarize what they really found and if any final messages are. So, I mean, it's it's not mandatory, but if they want to say something more, what's left of the talks or anything else, they'd like to present. They could come. Okay. Okay, yeah.